Welcome to tonight's program, 35 years on the Mars. Long-term monitoring, 35 seasons of winter raptor and waterfowl studies on the Bayshore's Mars River. Facts and figures, findings and rec reflections, questions and some real concerns. And this has been work carried out under the auspices of Citizens United to protect the Morris River. And we're also celebrating 30 years of wild and scenic river designation for the Morris, first designated in 1993. There's a long and distinguished history of nature study in the Delaware estuary. From the earliest days of the Academy of Natural Sciences, which was the hub of nature studies in America at that time, many scientists looked to the Delaware River and Bay. Alexander Wilson, the father of American ornithology, was one of the first to study South Jersey and the Bay, and the first to document the spring shorebird gatherings in 1813 when he documented ruddy turnstones in Morris River Cove. And down where the river meets the sea, in 1812, Wilson would discover and collect a bird new to science on the beach at South Cape May. After Wilson's death, his colleague George Ord would describe and name the bird the Wilson's Plover in honor of the great ornithologist. Since its founding, the DVOC has long recognized and enjoyed the Delaware River and Bay. And of course, Whitmer Stone added great depth to our studies of the bay with his uh, landmark book, Bird Studies at Old Cape May in 1937. He included the Delaware Bay Shore in his study area and documented many great discoveries. And some, of course, were not so great. Uh, this is a, a Stone quote from Bird Studies at Old Cape May. One of my first involvements with both the Bay and with the DVOC would begin with the irascible Ernie Choate. Ernie was president of the DVOC in 1958 and 59 and was an honorary member, named an honorary member in 1969. In what would be essentially my very first DVOC, DVOC field trip, I went with Ernie and Keith Seeger to see the then predictable spring roughs on the Morris River Causeway. And here is a terrible scan photo of two roughs that I took in April 1976 on what was then a Spartina salt marsh and mud flat and today a Phragmites jungle. And you'll hear more about that later. This is a bit better scan of another good Morris River shorebird, the first state record of spotted red shank at Heislerville in March 1977. That was during a field trip with Al Nicholson, who would become a true mentor in all things on the Delaware Bay Shore. Al was a DVOC member for many years. Pat and I enjoyed many great outings on the bay with Al over many years. Through Al Nicholson, we had the great fortune to meet Ed Manners, and the rest is sort of history. With Zoom, I can't see a show of hands, but I bet half of tonight's audience, at least the older members, saw their first saw wet owl with Ed. But these are stories for another time. Also through Al Nicholson, we met Joe Jacobs, who was the key person documenting the severe decline and imminent disappearance of osprey and bald eagles from our region due to DDT. In 1974, with Al and Joe Jacobs, I would see my life bald eagles, the last pair remaining on the Bay Shore and in all of New Jersey. And this is a photo of that pair. These were desperate yet heady times. When a single eagle made for a red letter day, and when you really didn't know if the wintering eagle you had just found might be the last one you would ever see. I've titled this talk 35 years on the Morris River, but actually it has been even longer. I joined the DVOC in 1978 and had my first paper in Cassinia in 1982. I had been studying New Jersey's wintering eagles since 1974. So yes, I have now spent nearly 50 years on the Morris River, and I guess that's my own patch, so to speak. 
The Morris River here at Morristown is the largest tributary to the bay short of the Delaware River itself. There is a tremendous history, human and cultural, on the Mars. There's an agricultural history. The entire river was once diked as farmland. Only one diked farm, diked farm remains today, the historic Bircham Farm on the upper tidal river. Through the years and through the seasons, there is a great mar maritime tradition. Here, the 1849 East Point Lighthouse. And much of this heritage is based on the oyster industry. And much of this tradition continues today. The abundance of fish and wildlife resources have attracted both subsistence and recreational hunters. Uh, residents and visitors for many generations and outdoor recreation and ecotourism remain vital to the Bayshore region. But the point is, so much of this history and heritage of the Delaware Bayshore has been based on the ongoing abundance of the fish and wildlife resources, primarily waterfowl. Of course, some of the major wildlife phenomena will not be covered here tonight. Here are red knots with New Jersey's tall ship, the A.J. Meerwald, the 1928 oyster schooner, restored in 1995. The Morris River is about 35 miles long. But the main stem, tidal Morris River, that portion below the dam at Union Lake in Millville, stretches about 14.4 miles, as measured on the center line, south to the East Point Lighthouse. Less known are the four tributaries, the Buckshootum, the Mananico, the Muskie, and here the Manumuskin River at dusk. The headwaters of these tributaries are often swampy, swamps that have a southern affinity, one might say, with species like yellow-throated warbler, prothonotary warbler, barred owl. It is a crossroads. It's where the southern swamp meets the northern forest, where biomes meet, scarlet tanager of the northern forest and, southern, and summer tanager of the southern swamps. Some of the pine oak forests at the headwaters are true pine barrens with many of the keystone plants and animals. Uh, here a pine barrens tree frog and here a pine snake. The Bayshore region is also well known for its bird migration. Here is the classic Allen and Peterson depiction of the fall migration from the uh, fall migration route shown in the Auk in 1937. We now know uh, today that it is much more like this. And if I digress here and go kind of on a tangent, it is germane to tonight's main topic. As an adjunct to the core winter studies that I'm presenting here tonight, in 1990 we conducted a hawk watch at East Point. And for the 60 days compare, we found that 36% of the Cape May hawk flight went around the bay. But the point is, we proved that this is an important migratory corridor and stopover habitat. Stopover habitat uh, leads to good winter numbers and a, and a major pathway for many raptors and other species. And now a few words about how all of this came about. As you may have guessed, this is not the Morris River. We don't have any Spanish moss yet, although we do have an emergent bald cypress swamp uh, forming on Delaware Bay. This program and paper has its origin actually in South Carolina. A uh, longtime good friend, Dr. Dennis Allen, the retired director of the U University of South Carolina Marine Lab in Georgetown, here he is holding an uh, iconic Delaware Bay fish, a black drum, uh, during a visit and uh, talking about his research and, and talking about my long-term work on the Morris River, 
I said, well, you know, you know, this is probably soft science. And he said, no. He said, this is a gold mine. Nobody has 30 years of data on anything. And that's, it was at the 30 year point. Uh, you're correct in that this is not the Morris River. Uh, this is Denali National Park. And you may ask, what does Denali have to do with the Morris River? Another key event in pulling this paper together uh, was uh, knowing Dr. Carol McIntyre. In 1978, Carol McIntyre was a fledgling hawk bander at the Cape May Raptor Banding Project. Today, she's senior wildlife biologist in Denali National Park. In 1916, 2016, she chaired the long-term monitoring session at the 50th anniversary Raptor Research Conference in Cape May. Uh, they shared the session on the value of long-term monitoring. Uh, and as she went around the room and asked who has like 20 years of data, who has 25 and so on, when she got to 30 years, there was only one other hand up in the room besides mine. So, you know, this was a real affirmation and a validation of long-term efforts. And I have to add the, the commitment of Citizens United to protect the Morris River and of that, CU can be very, very proud. Carol actually heads the Golden Eagle Monitoring uh, Project in, in Denali uh, and working with CTT, who some of you know, uh, Cellular Tracking Technology. Uh, we've talked about some of her work and uh, how the, the talons of a Golden Eagle are one of the occupational hazards that, that Carol faces, but there are others as well. And, uh, Having been to Denali, I'll never complain about Cumberland's occupational hazards again, although we do have some real ones here as well. And now to the meat of tonight's program. This monitoring project has its beginnings in late 1986, early 1987. This was just a, a year after CU Morris River gained its nonprofit status. Uh, and it the monitoring came about in response to proposed barge ports. There was two major barge ports proposed for the river and associated dredging, which would have changed the, the nature of the river for all time. Uh, the purpose of the barge ports were to barge sand out of Cumberland County. And while I recognize that sand mining is, is a major part of Cumberland County's economy, as this slide indicates, it is not really sub sustainable in the long term. And uh, if you're familiar with John Prine's uh, song, uh, Muhlenberg County, with Mr. Peabody's coal train, we could really see uh, Cumberland County and Mr. Peabody's sand barge done hauling it away. The previous information on the Mars was anecdotal at best, and in concert with CU Mars River, we determined that the river had some major natural resources, eco-values that were not being considered in the planning, big numbers of waterfowl, and at that time, really some of the only bald eagles. So there was a need for systematic surveys. We set up nine uh, survey points, uh, point count locations, uh, the first being at, at the mouth of the river, East Point, overlooking uh, Mars River Cove. And you can see <laughs> at some of these early photographs, you'll see that uh, we, uh, some of the winter conditions we frequently encountered in the early years of the surveys. Uh, the next one was at Heislerville. Uh, many of you are familiar with the impoundments there. And this is what they looked like in midwinter. Uh, moving on to Leesburg, uh, this was not the time of the day we were doing our monitoring. The Morris River Causeway Bridge. And finally, uh, the Galetto Dock on the upper river, uh, which offered a very uh, expansive view of, of the northern section of the river. The northernmost point was uh, the Peak property, natural lands. Uh, Peak Preserve, 
uh, looking into one of the big coves near the Morris River Bluffs, so we're just south of Millville here. And in 1996, we added the bivalve impoundments when the uh, estuary enhancement program came to fruition and uh, the impoundments were opened up with the uh, trails, observation points, and so on. To make a long story short, we proved major concentrations of waterfowl, snow geese, American black duck, mallards, and northern pintail. Uh, and numerous, well, for the, at the time, uh, three or four bald eagles were numerous, uh, but we proved the use of the river by eagles, red tails, and perhaps uh, one of its most iconic uh, birds, the northern harrier. We published the data in 1988 in Records of New Jersey Birds. And again, to make a long story short, uh, the uh, barge, barge ports were uh, denied. The permits were denied and uh, in part you know, from, from the uh, monitoring work, but mainly due to strong, very strong CU uh, Morris River advocacy. And then that w in, led to the wild and scenic river status and the Mars was preserved and protected in many ways for many more seasons. And thanks to the work of CU. But here's where it gets interesting. The decision to continue to monitor the status and trends uh, and possible changes. And this was a really fortuitous decision with you know, one that showed great forethought and vision. When the Citizens United decided to keep the studies going, we've now conducted 341 winter surveys over 35 years with the same observers, the same nine point counts, so the protocols have not changed. <clears throat> In uh, uh, Jim Dowdell was the, the second observer on all these surveys. The Cohansey River was added in in 1990, and we've now done 85 surveys over 32 winter seasons on the Cohansey. It wasn't really a control river, but it was a comparison uh, to find out if the Morris River findings were, were valid, if you know, they were similar, were, were they localized or are they more widespread in the region? So we use the same methodology, nine point counts, and we can really um, compare the rivers pretty well because they're, uh, again, measured on the center line. They're pretty close to the same length. And we found similar values on the Cohansey, uh, both raptors and waterfowl. And it was about 1990 we added all water birds into our surveys uh, and added Spring and, uh, spring and fall counts, the, the shoulder seasons to the winter, but all that is really uh, a story for another time as well. <clears throat> what have we learned over the now 35 years? We'll start with snow geese. There's many ways to look at the data, to review and analyze the data. Uh, Daily peaks and seasonal averages, what we did was compare uh, seven different five-year segments adding up to 35 years. But it's much more easy to look at uh, this way, looking at the, the median and the average. The, the, using the median rather than the average is a better pr predictor of likelihood and trends and, and probably seasonality as well, the amount of time birds spend on the river. Canada geese, the spike, is in a, the spike here is an anomaly that was a very cold winter and a midwinter incursion of waterfowl driven south by the freeze-ups to the north. Uh, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, you might think, uh, that we haven't seen a real increase in, in Canada geese. We feel like we're not sampling uh, resident geese, but, but due to the season we're, we're, that we're monitoring true wild Canada populations. Uh, so migratory birds rather than the local golf course geese. 
ducks. Black duck is a mainstay species, uh, and uh, that was certainly one of the species of concern on the river. And we've seen a, a real, a very major decline uh, from high counts of over 8,000 birds in the early years, average, medians of you know, two to 4,000. We now just see a few hundred each fall and winter. Mallards, same thing. Uh, we, we, in the early seasons, early winters, we were getting uh, s several thousand, uh, medians of several thousand, and peaks uh, near 4,000 birds, and same thing, uh, that they number in just the hundreds uh, in the last few seasons here. Pintail is, was a, one of the real representative birds of the upper river. Uh, and the numbers have also declined drastically from, you know, 3,000, uh, some 3,000 bird peaks, and, and you can see the medians down to, once again, uh, in less than a few hundred at times. So pintails have really declined on the river as well. Uh, so the spectacle of the early years, and these were a couple of shots taken in the first few seasons. Uh, this is just a memory, but the proof is in, in some of these older photos. Why? Well, our hypothesis is that it's the loss of the wild rice acreage. The upper river uh, used to be covered in wild rice. This is the peak pro property looking south, and that's all wild rice out there. And this past season, I saw one wild rice plant. And what has happened? Some have suggested that it is Canada goose herbivory in spring and summer. Uh, Canada geese do eat the shoots of the emergent wild rice. Uh, so eating the, 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 the tiny shoots as it comes up. Uh, and there's also an invasive Bidens on the river. Uh, so there's a number of theories as to what has happened. But wild rice is a freshwater or to slightly brackish water plant. And sea level rise, uh, the change in, in sea levels on the river are dramatic. And far more salt water is getting up into the system, getting farther up the river. and and it, it actually comes with greater velocity, scouring, creating mud flats, and then there's some subsidence as well. Drought and withdrawals mean less fresh water entering the system. So it's a very multifaceted issue. Uh, Phragmites, uh, common reed grass, is also a major issue. And this is a little counterintuitive when you think about it. And, and theoretically, Phragmites doesn't like uh, deep water or higher water. But there is a sweet spot of salinity that Phrag loves. And, and again, the, the salinity increasing on the upper river. Um, so in, in some cases, Phrag is pushing the uh, the the wild rice out, but the other, and, and of course we're talking about ducks here mainly, but raptors can't hunt in dense Phragmites, so that's a factor in, in the raptor numbers as well. This is uh, the view from the Morris River Causeway Bridge. It's a sea of Phragmites, and this is exactly where the roughs were photographed in 1976, and you'll see that there's no salt marsh left. Even on, on the upper river, the areas that were once wild rice, um, the, you, you have these little islands of frag form. And every year, they, they, they somewhat double in size. So you can see, almost like a cancer on the marsh, the Phragmi Phragmites islands taking over. Another factor in the decline in waterfowl is the trend towards milder winters. 
we certainly don't see the freeze-ups that we did in the early years. Uh, the winters are, are far more mild. Uh, so these are older, <laughs> older images of the, the river and bay. Uh, and from the, the on the upper river, complete freeze up here. But one of the things that would happen in the early years on the 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 river bends, there would always be open water where the wa the waterfowl would concentrate. But mild winters result in fewer migrants. Uh, there's no question about that. And we certainly have great documentation of the milder winters. Here's the Atlantic City Marina. And uh, maybe, you know, the, uh, the uh, five or six degrees may not seem like a lot, but it's, it's enough to keep the rivers from freezing, and it's enough to keep uh, waterfowl often well to the north of us. Uh, spring seems to be a particular problem in that spring migration, uh, the phenology has changed. Spring migration seems to... Uh, occur in the blink of an eye anymore where uh, birds would stage on their way north uh, in, in early spring. Uh, today they, they just blitz on through. There is uh, some good news though. Green-winged teal has definitely increased. Here's a, a bird that's bucking the trend. Uh, green wings are ben benefiting from the milder winters they're remaining farther north in winter. So where most of them used to uh, move south of us um, in recent years, we have good numbers. This is an older photo of them on, on, the, uh, on the ice, but uh, it, today at by, places like Bivalve and Heislerville, there's big numbers of green-winged teal on the mudflats. So that's some good news. Other species of ducks are present, but not in uh, big enough numbers to really uh, calculate any trends, uh, gadwall, American widgeon, shoveler, blue-winged teal, and here uh, wood ducks uh, actually migrate earlier and later than, than the, the winter season that we're monitoring, so we don't usually get many number, big numbers of those two species. Diving ducks uh, are certainly a mainstay on the lower river. Um, <coughs> Bufflehead uh, are, are always numerous in uh, the Heislerville impoundments uh, and Morris River Cove. Some years there's good concentrations of scoters uh, at East Point, depending on the oyster set actually, how, how many young oysters are available to feed upon. In recent years, there's been a, uh, every winter, there's a really nice concentration right around the, uh, the packing plant docks in, in bivalve, uh, both greater and lesser scop, and uh, increasing numbers of uh, long tailed ducks and common golden eye as well. One of the principal principal species of Morris River Cove would be red-breasted merganser. Some winters, and the, in, in former days with colder winters, the numbers could be fairly high there. And, of course, one of everyone's favorite hooded mergansers. On the right day, in the right place, waterfowl numbers can still be substantial and somewhat regionally significant, but those days are getting harder to find. Uh, as I said, you can blink and miss, miss the spring waterfowl migration anymore. What about status and trends of raptors? We did the same thing. We, we, uh, each, each five-year segment, we would uh, summarize the data into a five-year report and uh, could compare the, uh, the seven five-year segments, but I don't want you to stare at that. But turkey vulture, what's happened in 35 years? Well, as you would well suspect, uh, numbers of vultures have really risen on the river. Uh, probably more so than these trend lines indicate. Uh, for one thing, we feel that you know, they're so numerous that you, we have to be really careful not to double count them, and, and I think the counts actually are conservative uh, at this point because you're trying not to 
uh, count the same birds twice. Black vulture has seen one of the most dramatic increases uh, from the early days when you would see <laughs> none or one or two uh, and to recent years when you're, you're seeing uh, medians of 30 and 40 and peaks of 60 to 80, <laughs> that sort of thing. So uh, nature's cleanup crew, a southern species moving north due to climate change. A uh, few species of raptors that are always present but not in big enough numbers to really do any trend analyses. Red-shouldered hawk, there's always a merlin or two around. And in some winters, uh, one or two golden eagles are on the river. But uh, in recent years, with the lack of waterfowl, we see, we're seeing fewer goldens. The goldens are, are not attracted to the waterfowl like they once were. Sharp-shinned hawk is certainly uh, secretive and hard to find and count, but um, we've had very uh, consistent numbers over the years. The downward trend there in the peak numbers might be reflected in, uh, might reflect the fact that the, uh, there's documentation that many more sharp shins are staying farther north, uh, recording greater numbers on Christmas counts, uh, and that's because of, well, temperature for one thing, but probably uh, bird feeders in, uh, in uh, New England and so on. Every bird feeder has its sharp shin, or Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawk have shown a slight increase, um, in a low density species, secretive, but uh, where we, you know, early years see just one or two, now we're seeing four to six uh, moose surveys. So, Cooper's coops are increasing as well. Peregrines have also seen an increase, a very low density species. You'll notice the numbers uh, we see early years. We're lucky to see one. Now we just see uh, two or three per day, uh, but peregrines have, have also increased quite nicely. Bald eagle, uh, as you would expect. There's been a huge recovery of bald eagles from the early days, that first year doing the barge port uh, work, uh, trying to hopefully uh, prove that there were eagles on the river, but we'd see just one or two uh, per survey. And of course now, as you can see, we're uh, often seeing 40 to 50 on a given survey. This is in part, uh, due, of course, to the recovery from the DDT years, but also New Jersey Fish and Wildlife started the Non-Game Endangered Species Project, began reintroducing eagles uh, beginning in 1983 at the hack site uh, near Turkey Point. And so you know, this recovery of eagles is just astounding. There are now uh, at least 15 nests along the river uh, from Union Lake south to East Point. Uh, it's a, a bird that's in sight virtually all of the time. And we get to see some, some you know, great plumage variations and so on. Uh, we <laughs> get to record kettles of eagles. I think 10 is our record, 10 in a kettle. Uh, and some great chases as they uh, all vie for um, territory and uh, nest sites and so on. Uh, one of the fun things has been to uh, see some of the fishing and here's uh, the old days at Heislerville when it was frozen one winter and this eagle has picked up a, uh, a giant gizzard shad and this uh, eagle here is picking up a winter killed black drum. Again one of the iconic fish of Delaware Bay. And you see them everywhere. This, this uh, bald is sitting right over the fish cleaning table at the Fortescue Marina. Uh, here's two sitting on the marina roof uh, at Bivalve. And this one was sitting over the Wawa when we stopped to get our coffee. And now the bad news begins. The American kestrel decline. Uh, 35 years. It was never a numerous species on the Morris, but usually two to five were recorded each day in the early years. The spike you see there it was 10 migrants uh, on the last day of the count, 
count period and <laughs> year 22 there. Um, but even though they were migrants, you had to include them. But still, even with that, you have a very uh, severe uh, declining trend. And it did start quite early, and I think the DVOC well knows this. It's, it's widespread. It's greater than the Mars. Uh, it's, it's loss of habitat. It's loss of, of meadows, the loss of dairy farms. It's the rise, the increase in mechanized agriculture. And at least in, along the Bay Shore, uh, it's the increase uh, sod farms and uh, nurseries, uh, the uh, orchards, the orchard industry, uh, heavy uh, pesticide use at times. It might be preserved farmland, but it, it's not habitat. And, and in recent years, the rise, the increase in ornamental nurseries, this may be open space, but it absolutely is not kestrel habitat or habitat for anything. And this has, again, as many of you know, has led to the loss of the complete grassland guild of birds over much of the region. Uh, Eastern meadowlark, uh, vesper sparrow, grasshopper sparrow, and bobwhite, uh, one of the last to go, and kestrel seems to be following that uh, that direction. There are fewer, uh, get, uh, looking wider than the Morris River, there are fewer American kestrel nests in New Jersey now than bald eagles. There's a glimmer of hope in uh, Steve Eisenhower's uh, nest box program in Salem County. Uh, Steve Eisenhower of Natural Lands uh, has been uh, doing a, a yeoman effort uh, with the nest box program in uh, both uh, both Salem County and uh, in uh, Pennsylvania as well. So Kestrel is bad news and it's completely loss of habitat, I believe. Another early loss was rough-legged hawk. Rough legs, 35 years on the Mars. We never got many, but in the first uh, six or eight years of the count, we'd get you know one to one to four every survey. And now it's been several years since we saw even one. Uh, and there's a couple factors here. Uh, one is the loss of the high marsh. By high marsh, I mean Spartina patens, salt hay, uh, grows on the higher marsh around the edges of the wetlands. And this was always the preferred habitat of rough legs. Uh, here's a salt hay marsh in summer. But salt hay has been rapidly replaced by, uh, by Spartina alterniflora. Uh, and this is the uh, salt marsh cordgrass. Uh, and it only takes an inch or two inches of additional water, additional tidal level, to, uh, to select for alterniflora rather than the salt hay. Salt hay used to be a huge industry on Delaware Bay. There were numerous salt hay farms, uh, but these pictures are, are basically history at this point, taken in the early 70s. Uh, for many years, the uh, mosquito control efforts tried to eliminate the salt hay, uh, and they called it open marsh water management, where instead of ditching to drain, they ditched to flood, to bring the extra water in that would uh, then fl flood out our, uh, the, the patens and select for the alterniflora. They call it an open, open marsh water management. I preferred to think of it as the black rail eradication program. But these next few images here, this was all salt hay when these studies began. Uh, every and they're completely alterniflora at this point, which is still good habitat for a number of species, but it's not, it's, it's where the rough legs once hunted. Another aspect of this though is, as I mentioned before, mild, mild, milder winters produce fewer migrants, 
and with less need to move south. And this is true both raptors and waterfowl. But the same thing that we've seen with rough leg is, of course, uh, been seen with short-eared owl as well. They select the same high marsh, Spartina patens, hunting areas. And while the protocols of this study didn't uh, really count uh, short-eared owls, but we have seen a, a similar decline. I think everybody would agree that there's way fewer than, than previously. And of course, we, we wonder where it's all going to stop. Sedren is already gone as a breeder. It's only a very rare migrant anymore. Uh, salt marsh sparrow is uh, certainly uh, very endangered, vulnerable. And who knows where it'll stop? Uh, seaside sparrow. I, I see, I hear many fewer Virginia rail than I once heard. And we have to think about you know, what these few inches of additional water can mean to nesting birds. So, uh, back to the upper Morris. Uh, actually, the, the headwaters here, but uh, actually this is back to Denali, and that is Denali uh, just to the left of center at the top. Uh, the mountain is out, as they say. And back to Carol McIntyre. When Carol, uh, again, chaired that conference in... Uh, uh, chaired the uh, keynote talk about long-term research at the at the uh, 50th anniversary uh, Raptor Research Conference. One of the things she asked, uh, she said, "How many of you that are in involved in long-term studies have been blindsided towards the end by something you never expected, th that you thought you knew it all, but all of a sudden everything changed?" in, in uh, later years of your study. And uh, a number of hands went up and, and mine was one of those hands. And you might say I've saved the worst for last. Northern Harrier is not only a, a flagship species of the Delaware Bay Shore marshes, but maybe even a keystone species as well. And interesting, when we looked at the first 25 years, everything looked pretty good. Uh, the trend lines were increasing. Uh, we thought, you know, harriers were doing just fine. When we kept the study going out to 30 years, all of a sudden the trend lines have really flattened out. And, uh, you know, we're not seeing an increase anymore. And then when we took it to 35 years, what happened here? Um, we're seeing a decline, particularly in the last six or seven years. Uh, so this is, this is uh, troubling, to say the least. And look at this. The six lowest years uh, of all 35 were the final six years. What about red tails? Well, almost the same thing, the same picture. Uh, in the 25-year point, uh, red tails seem to be increasing. We had a really nice uh, steady median line there, uh, usually 40 to 45 every winter. We took it out to 30, and all of a sudden, we start to see a flat or slightly dec declining trend tails. At 35 years, the decline is even greater. And like Harrier for Redtail, the six lowest years of all 35 are the last six years. So what happened with Redtails? Well, for Redtail and Harrier, we know that uh, numbers are, you know, are, are declining at, at the uh, hawk migration counts, I think both at Hawk Mountain and at Cape May. Uh, once again, uh, fewer birds moving south, uh, so we know that. but. There's something else that had occurred here in, in years 25 and 26, so uh, 2011 and 2012, we had Hurricane Irene and we had uh, Superstorm Sandy. And to uh, show this for the Northern Harrier trend as well, this is, uh, this is significant because in the years that followed, uh, we see very few Harriers. There was very uh, strong uh, 
anecdotal evidence after these storms of all the marsh rodents that were killed, simply killed by the flooding, by the high tides. Uh, the meadow vole is certainly the uh, principal prey of both harriers and red tails on the Delaware Bay shore, and uh, certainly um, short ears and barn owls as well. Uh, things like short-tailed shrew, rice rats, and even uh, rat, uh, muskrats. Uh, the locals will tell you that the muskrat populations are nothing like they used to be. But uh, we, we, we know that Sandy uh, killed off a, a number of these, uh, a, a, a huge percentage of the marsh rodents. Uh, Sandy put uh, uh, about eight, you know, 4.5 4 feet above uh, uh, the normal high tide, so that puts about eight feet of water on the, on the marsh. And the, the point is, it, it hasn't ended. We have an increasing number of winter storms. Uh, here's uh, in uh, winter of 2018, we had four nor'easters in three weeks. And it just doesn't seem to end. Isaias in August of 2020. So we wonder if what we saw here was the, um, you know, we have, we have increasing number of storms and, and an increasing frequency and greater height of, of the high tides on the marshes. And it, it impacts so many birds. Here, a clapper rail. Uh, by the roadside, and this one just uh, standing on the floating rack uh, of a high tide at one of the local marinas. And virtually every full moon tide now, they, some, in, the, in Atlantic City they call it nuisance flooding, but uh, the coastal flood days are increasing, uh, and, and so it, it's every not every high tide, but certainly every moon tide, every uh, full moon tide. Here's a king tide on the upper Morris on November, November 6, 2021. So this is now the new norm on the Delaware Bay shore, unfortunately. Uh, we see this a lot. You hear about a lot about tipping points in, in climate change discussions, but we believe that Irene and Sandy were a tipping point from which we have not seen a recovery. Uh, we haven't seen a recovery of voles, nor their, their predators, the red, ta red tails and harriers. So we just saw the 11th uh, anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, but the legacy of that storm live on. And of course, there's the legacy of the ghost forest too. Uh, it's said that Sandy may have inundated and killed at least a third of the Atlantic white cedar forests in New Jersey. But uh, again, in the early years of the study, these areas were all forested. The main point is that rising sea levels are a major factor in the high marsh becoming low marsh and wetter marsh, and a factor in the loss of wild rice too on the upper river. Uh, back to the Cohansey, again, we have a comparison river, and we've seen the same thing there. Because of fewer surveys, I've only charted the peaks here, but uh, declining red tail numbers, uh, taking it out to the 32 years, we've now done uh, surveys on the Cohansey. And for Harriers, the 27 years, and then finally taking it out to 32 years. So this you know, certainly confirms and corroborates our findings on the Morris. So let me, let me state this plainly. For harriers and red tails for the past decade, peak counts don't, don't come close to the daily average counts of the first 25 years. And I'll even say it again. Our peak counts don't come close to the daily average counts of the first 25 years for these two species. So to kind of recap the bad news here tonight, percent decline over 35 years, and this is just using the, comparing the first segment to the final segment, 
but um, which is a you know really a rough way to do this. But if we look at it that way, northern harriers have declined 26 percent, red tails 35, pintails 85 percent, mallard 88, and black duck an astounding 92 percent decline. Cornell and in their in in the the study that they uh, recently made public the, uh, in 2019 that North American birds have declined by almost 30 percent since 1970. Uh, Three billion birds have been lost. And they said, you know, interestingly that uh, because of management and protection that waterfowl and raptors have bucked that trend, but not on the Mars, not on the Mars River. And I start to wonder if Indeed, the gray ghost might become a true ghost on the Delaware Bay shore. It all continues. We just had one of the hottest summers in the history of the planet. Uh, we all faced the, the smoke from the, the fires, the Canadian wildfires this summer. And I'm just going to leave it by saying we've got to get serious about solving some of these issues. Well, there, there, there is a bit of good news, and I do want to try to end on a, on, a, on a positive note. If there has been one constant, it is change. And it was Roger Tory Peterson said, it is like the balancing of a ledger, that you have debit birds and you have credit birds. Well, some of the debits, uh, besides what we've already talked about tonight, uh, rough grouse <laughs> photographed uh, on the survey route in uh, one of the first years of the study. A covey of uh, Bob White uh, also photographed early years of the study. Ringneck pheasants uh, used to breed in, uh, abundantly in Cumberland County. They're all gone, but they've been replaced by a booming wild turkey population. The uh, the reintroduction first began in uh, 1977, and today uh, <laughs> they're virtually everywhere we go. And I've been particularly interested in following the uh, uh, the uh, white morph or the smoke morph, as they call it. Uh, it's a thing, and uh, we see it with some frequency in Cumberland County. Who would have guessed that sandhill cranes would become, if not a common, but a regular wintering bird in Cumberland and Salem counties? And indeed a nesting bird as well. Round pelicans. Uh, over Labor Day weekend, a uh, trip on the Cape May Lewis Ferry, there were 800 brown pelicans uh, around the Lewis breakwaters. Mississippi kites uh, breed in New Jersey. Common ravens have uh, returned after you know, many years absent. The last uh, record that Stone had was 1937. And uh, ravens breed throughout the region now. And uh, pileated woodpecker, uh, this uh, have finally slowly repopulated our, our woods uh, in South Jersey. This was photographed uh, last year at Belle Plaine State Forest. And who can... Uh, and we have to talk about the recovery of osprey. When I first began birding the Delaware Bay, going back to, again, to 1974, there was one osprey nest on the Morris River in a natural nest on private property. You had to get just the right angle to see the osprey nest. Uh, today, again, the recovery from DDT, but also a very active uh, nest platform program uh, carried out by CU Morris River and uh, uh, the Non-Game Endangered Species uh, Project. Uh, there's now over 75 nests on the Morris River. So an incredible recovery there. There's still a lot to see and do in, uh, in Cumberland County. There's abundant birding opportunities uh, almost at any season. We haven't really talked about the shorebird phenomenon at all, but uh, it is one of the high points, the management of Heislerville Wildlife Management Area. 
and uh, the uh, the huge numbers of uh, Dunlin and some palmated sandpipers that that stage there. And in some of our shoulder season work, one day we counted over 45,000 shorebirds uh, on the Morris River in a single day in May. I, another positive uh, point uh, is the amount of protected acreage in Cumberland County. Since we began this study, a Dix Wildlife Management Area has doubled in size. It's now over 5,400 acres of incredible habitat. Bear Swamp East was protected in 1983, and then Bear Swamp West was uh, added, uh, actually, in 87 or 88. Uh, here's Bear Swamp East, and some of the old growth forest, and Brian Johnson with Natural Lands in Bear Swamp West. Uh, the Fortescue Glades protects, uh, I think, close to 10,000 acres near Turkey Point. So, again, a lot of uh, birding opportunities. Uh, the, the Glades, the Peak Preserve here, and, and the, the different forms of, of access have, have, have definitely um, improved over time. The Hansi Creek boat access, both the launching ramp and uh, kayak uh, launch area, Turkey Point, and even the uh, the, the 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 cruises on the Morris River, uh, uh, some of the pontoon boats working the area, and the party boats, and there's even the two uh, major uh, festivals: the Bald Eagle Festival in winter and the Purple Martin. Uh, cruises in uh, in the uh, in August. We've documented one of the largest purple martin roosts in uh, eastern North America. Forms on the Morris River, just right around the Morris River Causeway, uh, each August. And uh, it's interesting <laughs> to 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 think that they are using the very phragmites that were. Um, uh, sort of complaining about for all these other species. Uh, they are roosting in the Phragmites. But there's still uh, abundant opportunities in Cumberland. And really at all seasons as well. So, to wrap things up, uh, I. I think the, the important point here is that the findings of these studies have been used by CU Morris River in their advocacy efforts, and, and they're, particularly in uh, this whole list of, of things that they do, um, and the wildlife management decisions and testimony in land use proceedings. These could be considered buzzwords, but working with this group, uh, they really believe in everything and they're involved in, in the pilot projects and even uh, looking at active restoration of some of the wild rice areas, the former wild rice areas. So uh, there's, there's some good news as well. For every complex problem, there is a simple answer and it is wrong. <laughs> Uh, this was uh, actually quoted by Keith Bildstein. So there, there often aren't actual easy answers. There are many confounding vi variables involved. We know that the mild, milder winters result in fewer migrants. Um, so compounding variables, confounding variables. And of course, as John Muir put it, when we pick at anything, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. But the point is, um, we're, we've got some really good people working on this. This is Carlo Rossini on the right, the uh, executive director of CU Morris River and uh, a CU uh, Morris River field trip at East Point. That's uh, Jane Galetto, uh, just left of the uh, East Point Light, uh, the executive director and certainly one of the founders of CU Morris River. Uh, I've this um, doesn't seem like it would uh, be
be relating to environmental issues, but it really it really says it a, a lot here. Uh, the uh, there's an old saying among cons conservationists that you have to win a battle over and over again, but you can only lose it once. I came across this intriguing quote, and it's sobering maybe, but for us there is only the trying, and we are trying hard, and uh, CU Morris River is trying hard. So, okay, time to land this thing. Uh, Jim Dowdell and I have been very fortunate to have uh, had this long-term monitoring project to have worked with CU Morris River for so many years. And over the years, we've always felt that like every time we go out, we're taking the pulse of the river. There have been some incredible days and some incredible memories. Uh, and even after all these time, there, there are still red letter days on, on the Morris, tundra swans over uh, East Point. Uh, <clears throat> a number of times we found uh, Ross's geese and cackling geese Eurasian widgeon, Eurasian teal, uh, annual in, in uh, small numbers. Uh, the, the winter of the redneck greben uh, invasion and a breeding plumage, uh, red-throated loon in the Heislerville impoundment of all places. And of course, it goes on and on. <laughs> but uh, every day has certainly brought something of, of great interest and these photos, again, are all taken during the surveys on the survey route, including uh, Curlew Sandpiper, some of you remember and have probably seen them, <coughs> excuse me, at, uh, at Heiserville. Uh, and this was the day that there were actually two, and there they are. And you wanted to tell the, uh, the male to wake up, that your, uh, your bride is, is right behind you there. And some of the red letter days have not uh, always been birds. Uh, there's, in one of the early years, a, a river otter floated past on an ice floe, and uh, a harbor seal hauled out at, at East Point on the rocks. And uh, one very special day, uh, this curious mink uh, decided to allow us a very good look in photographs. I think if I had a single one day out, uh, uh, as the best of the best, uh, and it was the day that uh, there were not one but two snowy owls at, uh, at East Point. And uh, that was uh, 2013 during the big winter invasion. And, but close, you know, cl close behind that was the day I f finally managed to photograph both a young golden and a young bald together. Uh, and this was on the Cohansey. So there's been some, some wonderful times and we've had some wonderful, uh, wonderful sightings over all the many years. And I, I wanna thank, uh, tonight I wanna thank all of uh, the, my fellow DVOC attendants and members and guests alike. I may not get to many of the meetings but I hope, as I related earlier, the DVOC has always been an inspiration, a benchmark, and a cornerstone of my humble ornithological wanderings and wonderings. And I want to thank also all the CU Morris River uh, people, the staff, trustees, members, and supporting, supporters. Thank you for uh, supporting these long-term studies over all these years. Thank you for your vision for the Morris River and the Delaware Bay Shore, and your can-do attitude has made all the difference. So my sincerest thank you to all, and uh, good birding, and good night.